you very much, and it's fantastic to be here, um, and also fantastic to be able to make a presentation about probabilistic numerics where I don't have to spend hundreds of slides motivating probabilistic numerics at the beginning, so we can just get straight to the math. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, something that I don't think you could call state-of-the-art anymore, um, a Bayesian conjugate gradient method. Um, so I understand you've already seen some, uh, some work that's related to this, so hopefully this will provide a bit of an underpinning for things that you've already seen. But before we get to uh, Bayes CG, what I want to start with is talking about how we solve linear systems in general, because this gives some motivation for how we solve them with this uh, Bayesian conjugate gradient method. So let's start by talking about the problem that we're interested in solving. Um, so this is a, a linear system, AX star equals B. Some of you may have seen it before. Um, so the goal of this problem is to find X star, um, this unknown vector in this equation, AX star equals B, where A is a given D by D matrix, which we assume throughout the talk to be invertible, because otherwise, what are we doing here? Um, and B is a D-dimensional vector which we're given um, and which we're allowed to interrogate at will. Um, so at some points in the talk, A will be assumed to be symmetric positive definite, um, but uh, that won't be on every slide, and I'll try to remember to point out which slides it is assumed on. So broadly speaking, there are two classes of solvers for linear systems. Um, the first class and the one that people um, usually are most familiar with, although I understand you've seen some iterative methods in the spring school already, um, are called direct methods. Um, and the reason these are called direct methods is because they, in some sense, solve the linear system in one shot. So an example of a direct method, which um, is particularly important in uh, Gaussian distributions and Gaussian processes, is a Cholesky factorization. Um, and there's a broad class of direct methods that are similar to it in that they function by first computing a matrix decomposition, which somehow simplifies the task of solving the linear system. So in the case of a Cholesky factorization, we first compute uh, a factor L, which is lower triangular, and which is such that A is equal to L, L transpose. And because L is lower triangular, this simplifies the problem because we can reduce um, solving the entire linear system to just one pass of forward substitution and one pass of backward substitution, which is considerably easier to work with. Um, so the uh, animation on the right here gives you an idea of how uh, a Cholesky factorization accesses elements of the matrix A in order to compute the uh, factorization. Um, and uh, I should say that this requires A to be symmetric positive definite. I've already forgotten to mention one of the slides where that's assumed. Um, uh, and in terms of the cost of a Cholesky factorization, um, so uh, there are two deficiencies here which iterative methods aim to address. Um, so the first is the computational time. So if we look at the access pattern of this Cholesky factorization, we can see the yellow cell is the cell that the Cholesky factorization is working on, and the white cells are just cells of the matrix that are being read uh, while the yellow cell is being updated. So we can see that there's pretty clearly three nested for loops here, which gives an order d cubed computation, d being the dimension of the matrix. Um, so uh, this is quite expensive. Um, and the problem with Cholesky factorization is that whereas we might think that maybe we could just stop doing the factorization early to include a lower cost, you can show that if you do that, then the error from using this sort of unfinished Cholesky factorization to solve the linear system can be arbitrarily large, which is bad. Second deficiency, um, so at least when naively implemented, um, Cholesky factorizations are order D squared in storage. So even if the matrix A is sparse and we don't need to store all of its elements because many of them are zero, um, when, again, when naively implemented, a Cholesky factorization um, will require you to score, store a dense factor. So you need to still score, store D squared elements to, to store the Cholesky factorization. So iterative methods aim to address this by instead of um, aiming to solve the system in one shot, in some sense, they aim to, uh, to produce a sequence, uh, the sequence xm, which converges to the true solution x star as m goes to infinity, or hopefully uh, a number much smaller than infinity. Um, and uh, the sort of um, holistic aim is that if we can write down an iterative method such that a small error is achieved for a small value of n, then we can stop this early, accept a small amount of error, um, and uh, still have a method that's faster than applying a direct method. <clears throat> So um, one of the most famous iterative methods um, that's still widely used today, or modifications of it are still widely used today, is called the conjugate gradient method. Um, and forgive me if you've seen this in some of the, uh, some of the workshops already, um, but I'm just going to go over some of the properties of it that are relevant for this Bayesian conjugate gradient method now. So one of the nice ways, I think, of motivating the conjugate gradient method is by thinking of it as a kind of modified gradient descent, particularly if you're from a machine learning background. That's a nice interpretation. 
So if we think of this functional f of x, this quadratic functional, a half x transpose ax minus x transpose b, by taking its gradient, we can see that it has a unique minimum at the point x star, the true solution to this linear system. Um, and so uh, if we were thinking of trying to find that true solution by minimizing this quadratic functional, um, then a sensible way of doing that might be to use gradient descent. So as I said, conjugate, the conjugate gradient method arises from doing a kind of modified gradient descent on um, this functional. So in raw gradient descent, recall that in order to minimize uh, this functional using uh, the sort of ordinary gradient descent, we would um, take steps at each iteration in the direction of negative gradient. So if we compute the gradient of this uh, functional, we see that this gives us steps in the directions sm tilde, uh, which are just b minus a xm minus 1, where xm minus 1 is the iterate at the previous iteration. And the CG search directions um, arise by augmenting these um, gradient descent search directions with an orthogonality constraint. So essentially, we impose that all of these search directions need to be orthogonal to each other in this inner product, uh, which is this inner product induced by A. Um, so it turns out that because we're using the residuals, these Rm minus 1s, um, which depend on our Xms, our iterates, um, to build our search directions, then rather than needing to orthogonalize against every previous, um, every previous search direction, we only need to orthogonalize against the last one, which is one of the sort of magical properties of CG, which makes it so efficient. Um, and uh, in this talk, usually when people work with CG, they work with orthogonal search directions, so these SM tildes directly. Um, in this talk, just to simplify notation, I'm going to make them orthonormal by dividing by um, the norm of these search directions, again, in the A norm. So to give an idea of um, what makes CG, why CG is preferable to ordinary gradient descent, I've got an animation here which shows a projection of uh, CG operating on a 100-dimensional problem projected down to just two dimensions so we can visualize. So if we uh, run the animation, what you can see here is um, gradient descent sort of wobbles around quite slowly, taking a very, very long time to get to the true solution x star, whereas CG um, gets there very, very quickly, right? In fact, we can prove that CG reaches the true solution x star after d iterations in exact arithmetic. And the reason for gradient descent taking a very long time to get anywhere is that if you look at the path followed by gradient descent, you can see that it's very wiggly, right? So this reflects gradient descent going back on itself a lot. Um, and uh, whereas CG takes a much more uniform path to the solution, which is due to this orthogonalization of the search directions that prevents CG from going back on itself. So in terms of the computational cost of CG, um, and bearing in mind the computational cost of Cholesky factorization that we saw earlier, um, it's only order MD squared in computation. Um, that's because we only need to do one matrix vector product in per iteration. So if we do M iterations, we get an order of MD squared. Um, and this is assuming that A is a, a full matrix. If A is a sparse matrix, this D squared cost is even lower. Um, but assuming it's a full matrix, in any case, um, then, if, then clearly if we can stop the algorithm sooner than after D iterations, i.e. if we can achieve a small error for a small number of iterations, then we'll win compared to, C to, to um, uh, Cholesky factorization. Um, and in terms of storage, it's only order D in storage. And this is because we only need to store vectors to implement CG. In fact, it can be implemented in a matrix-free way. So again, if A is sparse, we don't even need to store the full matrix. Um, so we only need to store two or three additional vectors to implement CG. OK, so um, there's a couple of pieces of uh, theory for CG, which are quite helpful to go through again for the purposes of um, talking about the Bayesian conjugate gradient method that we're going to introduce later. And the theory of CG sort of all revolves around this idea of a Krylov subspace. Um, so basically, a Krylov subspace is obtained by taking some uh, vet matrix A and some generating vector B and applying the first m minus 1 powers of A to B. Um, uh, and, and then taking the span of the set formed by applying the first m minus 1 powers of a to b. And of course, that's including the zeroth power here. So the reason that Krylov subspaces are quite important for understanding the properties of CG is that the search directions we can prove form a basis of this Krylov subspace. So then we have a theorem, which tells us something about um, sort of what, how uh, CG operates in terms of what space it explores. Um, so if we define this space Km star to be the shifted version of the Krylov subspace generated by the matrix A and the vector R0, and the shift is by some initial point X0, which is user specified, and that's the starting point for the algorithm, um, then we can show that the nth iterate from CG, Xm, minimizes the error um, in this A norm within this uh, shifted Krylov subspace Km star. 
So we have this kind of optimality result within this Krylov space. And then a second theorem, which is basically about how fast CG converges, tells us something about the relative error of CG, again, in this A norm rather than um, in the usual two norm that you would, you would think about. Um, so we can show that the relative error of the nth CG iterate uh, compared to the zeroth iterate uh, is bounded above by this thing on the right here, um, where uh, the important thing to, well, there's two important things that are controlling convergence here. The first one is this condition number of A, kappa of A. So because, uh, again, I've forgotten to mention that A is assumed to be positive definite on these slides. So because A is positive definite here, um, this condition number is the ratio of the largest and the smallest eigenvalues of A. Um, and we can see that if this condition number is close to one, then convergence will be basically instantaneous. Whereas if convergence, if the condition number is very large, then this ratio will be close to one and convergence will be much slower. And secondly, um, this is geometric in M. So this, uh, we've got this um, term which involves the condition number and this is to the power of M. So um, even if this uh, is quite close to one, convergence can still be quite fast. Okay. Um, so that gives us some confidence that we can, uh, if we use CG, we might be able to write down an iterative method that can beat a direct method because the error is converging so fast. So if the condition number is small, we might be able to achieve small error in a small number of iterations. Okay, so that's all the background on solving linear systems that we need to go through. And now we can start talking about Bayes CG, so this Bayesian conjugate gradient method. So first, let's talk about, um, in general, how we implement probabilistic linear solvers. So again, I think you may have seen some of this before, but generally in probabilistic linear solvers, um, for the purposes of writing, being able to write down a convenient posterior, um, we usually start with a Gaussian prior, right? So we assume that our unknown solution to the linear system is Gaussian, uh, normally distributed with mean x0 and covariance sigma0. And then we'll condition this prior on data that's provided by a set of search directions. So these search directions SM, we can think of as being similar to the search directions from CG. So for now, we're not going to assume that they have anything to do with the search directions from CG. They're just an arbitrary set of search directions that are user specified. And then we'll see how we can build a nice set of search directions that is related to CG in a few slides. So if we think of this as our data and we let um, YM be the projection of the right-hand side B against the mth search direction, then if we let S um, be the matrix formed by putting all of these search directions into a big matrix by stacking them as the columns, then we can uh, write down this by now probably very familiar form for the posterior distribution of a Gaussian after observing M pieces of linear information about that Gaussian, assuming the search directions are linearly independent. So we can show that the conditional distribution of my unknown solution on these M pieces of information is also Gaussian. It has a mean xm and a covariance sigma m, which have these complicated expressions, which I'm sure you've seen hundreds of times already, so I'm not going to unpack them in too much detail. Um, but what I will say is that um, the, what's a bit disappointing about this posterior is that we have to invert this matrix lambda m in order to compute it, right? Um, so this is a usual thing that you have to do in Gaussian process regression. This, is the gram this would be the analog there would be the Gramian matrix formed by taking, evaluating the kernel at all the pairs of points. Here, this is the matrix SM transpose A sigma naught A transpose SM. So it's a bit disappointing that we've taken one matrix inversion problem and just replaced it with a different one. And in fact, when we submitted this paper, a reviewer described this as a potential nightmare scenario of just having to sort of stack probabilistic solvers for linear systems on top of each other. Um, and uh, I don't even want to think about what that would look like. But fortunately, um, we can uh, make a good choice of search directions, which uh, simplifies this problem. Um, so if we look at the structure of this matrix, I mentioned the connection to uh, Gramian matrices before, and of course this is a Gramian matrix, right? It's the Gramian matrix formed by taking the inner product between all the pairs of search directions uh, in the inner product induced by this matrix A sigma naught A transpose, which appears just here. You can't, you can't see my cursor, can you? Sorry. Uh, it appears uh, just here. <coughs> so... Um, the point is that if we can construct the search directions such that they're orthonormal to each other or just generally orthogonal to each other, then um, this matrix lambda M will be diagonal or perhaps even an identity matrix. And even I, a statistician, can remember how to invert an identity matrix. So that simplifies the problem considerably. So that's exactly what the base CG search directions do. Um, so we start in the same way we do with CG. We start from um, by taking uh, this first search direction to be the zeroth residual, so the difference between B and AX0. 
And then we set the mth search direction to be obtained by taking the m minus 1th residual and just orthogonalizing it against the previous search direction. Um, but notably, the orthogonal, the uh, inner product that we've got here, instead of being an inner product with respect to A, as it is in CG, now it's an inner product with respect to A sigma naught A transpose. So remember, that's the matrix that we wanted to enforce orthogonality with respect to back here. So uh, if we build the search directions in this way, then after normalizing them, i.e. after dividing them by uh, their norm in this A sigma naught A transpose norm, um, then it turns out that the search directions end up being A sigma naught A transpose orthonormal, and that simplifies computation considerably. In fact, we can compute the mean and the covariance um, in an iterative way using these formulae just here, which are basically the formula formulae from before, but, um, but applying this, uh, this result about the orthog orthogonality of that matrix lambda m. So in terms of the cost, um, comparing this again to CG, um, the cost of applying base CG is slightly higher. Um, so in terms of computation, uh, it's still MD squared as a computational order, um, but depending on how you implement it and how many matrices you're pre prepared to pre-compute and store, uh, you need two to three matrix vector products per iteration instead of just one. Um, so slightly higher cost there. Um, and in terms of storage, um, you can, uh, instead of computing the full covariance matrix at each iteration, you can just store um, these uh, factors sigma naught A transpose SM, uh, sigma M minus one A transpose SM, um, and uh, only incur a storage cost of order MD. So again, this is higher than the cost from CG uh, by a factor of M because we don't need to store just vectors anymore. We now need to store some matrices. Um, but hopefully, um, as uh, you've seen over the course of the last couple of days, maybe that slight extra cost is worth it for the uncertainty quantification that this posterior provides in terms of the covariance can be thought of as providing you with, uh, for example, probabilistic um, error bounds or, or uh, credible sets um, for where your true solution might lie. So there's also some nice theory that we can, um, we can work out for the Bayesian conjugate gradient method, which basically all stems from the fact that uh, we have this um, Krylov structure for the search direction similar to the Krylov structure that we have for CG. Um, so firstly, if we let Km star be a shifted Krylov space, now shifted and scaled Krylov space, uh, similar to how it was in um, the uh, CG paper, so in, uh, in the CG results, so now we're sh still shifting by x0, but we have a different Krylov space, um, the generating matrix is now A sigma naught A transpose, and we're also sort of rotating and scaling by this matrix sigma naught A transpose, but the details of that are not too important. Basically, this is still an affine space that's related to a Krylov subspace, um, and we can show that the nth iterate from CG XM minimizes the error um, in, within this uh, shifted and scaled Krylov subspace. But importantly, the sense in which the error is minimized is no longer in the A norm. It's now in the prior precision norm, so the sigma naught inverse norm, which is slightly different. But if we squint at this result, we can see that if we uh, choose sigma naught appropriately, we can make um, base CG replicate CG exactly. So in particular, if we set sigma naught to be A inverse, and remember that uh, for CG to work, A has to be symmetric positive definite, then we'll see that a bunch of matrices cancel out here. So this one will vanish, and this one here will vanish. Um, and so the space uh, Km star will coincide with the space that's optimized within CG. Um, and similarly, this uh, norm in which we're performing the optimization will coincide with the norm in which we perform the optimization in CG. So uh, the iterate from base CG will then coincide with the iterate from CG, which is quite a nice property. Secondly, um, we can prove a similar result about the rate of convergence. So this is literally the same formula, but with um, the matrix inside this condition number here, uh, the matrix whose condition number controls the convergence replaced with this matrix sigma naught A transpose A, rather than just being the condition number of A as it was uh, in for, for CG. So what this means is that unless you um, choose your matrix sigma naught quite carefully, convergence of base CG can be quite a lot slower than CG because, for example, if we were to take sigma naught equal to A, then this condition number would be the condition number of A transpose A, which is the square of the condition number of A, which controls convergence in CG. Um, but taking a more positive spin on it, it means that if we de design our covariance matrix carefully, we, can, we have a sort of handle which we can turn to try and make this condition number close to one um, and then accelerate convergence. 
So in the last few minutes, I want to talk about a couple of um, experimental results. Um, so these are all just from a very simple simulation study. Um, and we're going to talk about three different choices of prior. So the first one is uh, sigma naught is A inverse. So remember, this is the prior that replicates CG. Um, the second one is sigma naught equals I. So I already said that this seems like quite a bad choice of prior, but it's also an important one to consider because it's kind of the default that you would think of if you were trying to think of a Gaussian prior. Um, and I've said here that it's an uninformative prior, even though it still says something quite strong about how large you, for example, expect the norm of the solution vector x to be. Um, but nevertheless, it says nothing about the covariance between the components, so it's uninformative in that sense. And then the third choice is a preconditioner prior. So this is motivated by this, um, this comment here, this comment here, um, which uh, says that we would achieve faster convergence if we can uh, design this covariance matrix to make this condition number as small as possible. So preconditioners are designed exactly to do that. Uh, we can think of a preconditioner as an approximate inverse for the matrix. So it's a matrix P such that we can compute its inverse very easily um, because the matrix has some kind of structure um, which we design to make the inverse easily computable, but also has the property that the condition number of P inverse A, so the preconditioner applied to A, is much smaller than the condition number of A itself. So if we can elicit such a preconditioner, then we can choose our prior covariance matrix to just be that preconditioner transposed against itself and then inverted. Um, and uh, that will satisfy this property, this required property, that the condition number of uh, sigma naught A transpose A um, is, is, is hopefully close to one, or at least quite, quite a lot smaller than the condition number of A transpose A itself. So in terms of the experimental setup, um, I've taken A to be a random sparse matrix um, and D to be 100. So we're in a 100-dimensional in a um, setting. I've drawn many test problems X star from uh, just a unit Gaussian distribution in 100 dimensions um, and applied base CG to M equals 100, which should be, um, should be full convergence. So we should have solved the system exactly after 100 iterations. And I'm comparing to two other choices of search directions, two other linear solvers, I guess, which um, I'll talk about on the next slide. So these are the results that we see in terms of the convergence rate of the posterior mean. Um, and uh, well, the, uh, there's a sort of mixed picture coming across here. So if we look first at the two comparisons, in the top left, I've got conjugate gradient method, so how rapidly that converges. And the multiple different lines are different sampled solutions, sampled from this unit Gaussian distribution. The second choice of directions here are what I've labeled a priori optimal directions. There's a sort of complicated optimality argument for why these directions might be good ones, but practically speaking, you can just think of them as being essentially random. And you can see that um, with these essentially random directions, the convergence is really quite bad. In fact, if this wasn't plotted on a log scale, you'd see that the rate of convergence was basically linear. Um, and then the other three um, choices of uh, the other three graphs show um, convergence with the base CG search directions for three, these three different choices of prior. Um, so with this uninformative prior sigma zero equal to I, we see that we uh, again have perhaps a slightly faster rate of convergence than with the a priori optimal directions, but still essentially it's a linear rate. So uh, not particularly an impressive result there. But as we encode successively more information about the matrix into the prior, so using either sigma naught as A inverse or this preconditioner prior, um, then we see that conver the convergence rate improves. So uh, we have a sort of qualitatively similar convergence rate when sigma naught is A inverse compared to CG, um, and a uh, much, much faster rate of convergence when we use this preconditioner prior. Um, so you might interpret this as base CG being way, way better than using uh, CG, but of course that's not giving the complete story because um, you, there's a preconditioned version of CG which could use the same preconditioning information and we could show that that converged much faster even than base CG with the preconditioner prior. But of course, um, what we're most interested in here is the uncertainty quantification that these solvers provide. So on the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna talk about that uncertainty quantification. Um, <clears throat> And uh, to talk about the uncertainty quantification, we should first identify what we'd like our solvers to look like in terms of uncertainty quantification. So um, at least in plain English, a way of uh, saying a sort of a useful property for a posterior distribution to have is we might say that it was well calibrated if X star typically looked like a draw from the posterior. Um, and typically here is a bit of a loaded term because there's a lot of um, 
underlying sort of assumptions behind it. Um, but uh, what we should think of typically as meaning is on average over multiple different X stars drawn from the prior. So if we draw lots and lots of X stars from the prior, we'd like all of them to typically look like a solution from the, uh, a draw from the posterior. So under the assumption that that's what we would like our um, uncertainty quantification to satisfy, we can derive a, a statistical test, um, or at least a sort of a sampling distribution, um, which, um, which a, a test statistic would follow um, to assess calibration. So if we write down this Z statistic, this is effect effectively um, normalizing the um, error uh, according to the posterior covariance matrix. So this is the difference between um, the posterior mean and the true solution, uh, X star, um, with, uh, in the norm induced by this sigma M dagger of X star. So this is, you can basically think of this as just being sigma M inverse, as a normal Z statistic would be. The reason for the dagger rather than an inverse is because sigma M is typically not full rank, so this has to be a pseudo inverse, but it doesn't really matter for the purposes of interpreting this, uh, this um, Z statistic. So this is just a, a sort of um, the error normalized by how large the posterior covariance thinks the error should be. So if the posteri posterior distribution is well calibrated according to this intuition at the top of the slide, then we can prove that this Z statistic, um, when applied to this random variable capital X, follows a chi-squared distribution with D minus M degrees of freedom when X is distributed according to the prior. Um, and I should note here that I'm really emphasizing the fact that both XM, the posterior mean, and sigma M, the posterior covariance, depend on the sol true solution X star um, because, uh, well, the data obviously depends on the true solution X star because the right-hand side does, um, and also the search directions might depend on the solution X star as well. So what we'd like to see on the left side is a bunch of lines that just follow this theoretical chi-square distribution, um, and unfortunately that's not what we see. Um, so if we look at um, the theoretical chi-square distribution, which is this gray dashed line, we can see that the only version of Bayes CG which follows this distribution is the one that uses these essentially random search directions, whose posterior mean uh, converged at this horrendously slow rate compared to all of the other versions of the solver. And then again, as we encode successively more information about the, uh, the matrix, about the problem, into the prior by using, for example, sigma naught is A inverse or sigma naught is P transpose P inverse, the quality of this uncertainty, uh, this uncertainty quantification compared to the ideal from this chi-squared distribution um, is successively worse. So in this sort of mildly uninformative prior, we see that we have something that's quite left shifted and then uh, for the two versions that encode a lot of information, um, we have to zoom in to actually see what's going on here. So this plot on the right is a zoom in of this chunk of the x-axis on the left. And we can see that these are really quite, um, quite catastrophically left shifted. So a left shift in these chi-squared distributions indicates very conservative uncertainty quantification. So practically speaking, that means that the posterior mean is much closer to the truth on average than the posterior covariance says it ought to be. So this is um, sort of saying that the posterior is, in, is effectively too wide. So what went wrong? Why um, do we not have uh, the kind of uncertainty quantification that we'd expect here? Well, the reason is that um, earlier I committed a, a crime against Bayes. Um, so uh, when we wrote down the search directions, remember that uh, if essentially we cheated. We wrote down that the nth search direction was going to be the m minus 1th residual orthogonalized against the previous search direction. And if we think about what this m minus 1th residual is, it's b minus a times x m minus 1, which is just a x star minus x m. So the search directions know what the true solution is. They depend on the true solution. And so if we then think about what our YMs are, so remember this is our data that we conditioned upon uh, by using Bayes' theorem, um, and, we condi uh, and our YMs were just SM transposed against B. Um, and because SM depends on X star, um, this means that we've got something that's not linear in X star. It has some sort of more complicated like quadratic dependence on X star. So that's why we cheated when we used Bayes' theorem. We pretended that this information was linear so we could apply the usual Gaussian conditioning formula um, when in fact it wasn't linear. Um, and that's what leads to this poor uncertainty quantification. So I don't have much time left, um, but I do want to talk about, um, to end on a slightly less negative note than that, because of course people have been working on uh, fixing this in the intervening years. This paper was published a few years ago now. Um, so uh, the sort of main idea to mitigate this is uh, we already cheated when we did the conditioning, so why not uh, p perform fur further crimes against Bayes and also build information about the problem into the prior? So if we do that, uh, that's 
called empirical Bayes, um, and we can essentially build a prior that uh, we can show has more favorable calibration properties by letting the prior know what the solution is going to be a priori, which you wouldn't usually be allowed to do, but again, as I said, we've already uh, broken the rules, so why not go with the whole hog? And then secondly, um, something you've already seen in the, in the workshop, uh, in the school, um, and in some of the, uh, some of the coding labs, um, is uh, there's a lot of exciting work on using BASE-CG in applications. So for example, people have been working on using it to build um, cool Gaussian process uh, solvers, which um, encode the computational uncertainty from sort of having incompletely inverted the matrix within that uh, Gaussian process. That's everything I have to say uh, for now, so thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions.